a wasp nest falls into a canoe. That can't be good. And how does that relate to the gospel passage? Stay tuned to Reach Out and Live. Welcome to Reach Out and Live, a program of music, scripture, and sermon, brought to you each week by the many viewers and members of First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi, my name's Jim, minister here at First Plymouth, and I am in a sermon series on Matthew chapter 13, where there are seven parables. Let's worship. Sing God a simple Make it up as you go along. Loud, loud, sing like you like to sing. God loves all simple things. For God is the simple. Bless the Lord, I will sing God's praises while I live all of my days. Blessed is the one who loves the Lord, blessed is the one who praises Him. From whence comes my help, I will lift up my voice to the Lord, singing loud, loud, for the Lord is my shade, is the shade upon my right hand, and the sun shall not smite me by day. Blessed is the one who loves the Lord. La da, la da, la da, and walks in God's ways.
Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. You probably have some family stories. You know those stories whenever you gather as a family that you tell again and again through the years because they're so interesting or formative or funny. Think now of one of your family stories. Let me tell you one of mine. My family was a big camping family. Now I don't mean adventuring so much in the wild. I mean church camp, Y camp, family camp. You know the type of camp I mean with a lodge and cabins and the lodge had ping pong tables. We're not talking Lewis and Clark stuff, but it was a wonderful experience of nature growing up. And all of my family were camp counselors when they were younger at these various camps. My dad was a camp counselor at a camp in Minnesota. And one of our favorite family stories is about when he was a sophomore in college, summer camp counselor there at this Y camp. And he was leading some young kids on a canoe trip on a lazy river. And he had two fifth grade boys in the front of his canoe. He was in the back of the canoe. And you know, fifth grade boys, they don't keep their oars in the water. They were splashing each other with the paddles and they would bang on tree branches that overhung the edge of the river as they went by. So my dad was constantly telling them to, you know, keep your paddles in the water. Well, as they passed under a tree, one of the boys slapped another branch with his oar and it knocked off a wasp nest that fell into the canoe. So suddenly the canoe is engulfed with all these angry wasps and my dad has two fifth grade boys with him and he yells at them to jump off the side of the canoe into the water, but they're really young and he can't lose track of them in the water. So he's ending up holding each boy on each side of the canoe under the water by the scruff of the neck and their t-shirt as these wasps are, are now swarming him. Meanwhile, as he's holding the boys, he's trying to kick the wasp nest out of the canoe with his feet. So he's got all this going on. He finally was able to kick the nest out, but when the camp doctor checked them all out, the boys had a couple wasp bites. My dad had over 200 wasp stings all over his body. And this became a family story because it illustrates this mix of bumbling and heroism, sort of a fumbling courage. I mean, he got himself in a bad position and it was silly. He was doing the best he could. That family story became an image for us about holding on when things are tough or things feel stinging, right? Holding on even when you're kind of bumbling your way through life. It was a beloved family story. The Christian family has beloved stories. Mostly, they're cherished stories about Jesus and his life, but they're also the stories of Jesus. Remember that Jesus taught primarily by teaching in stories or parables, and those have become our wonderful family stories. Think of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, parable of the sower. Oh, these family stories we tell ourselves because they're so formative and shape who we are. I'm in a sermon series on Matthew 13 where Jesus shares seven stories. And it's almost as if he's hunting for an interesting image that will stick as a family story. He talks about a sower and a mustard seed and a buried treasure and a pearl, and these have become 
our cherished stories. This week, it's the story of a woman, a woman villager doing her daily work, kneading the yeast into a massive amount of flour or dough, and it works its way through the whole process. It's in this story that we enter the daily work, the daily life of a woman in a poor village. This is an important family story. Because let me tell you something about the Christian family. It is now over the entire world in many, many settings and many, many poor villages. So this has become a beloved image. Let me tell you about the Christian family. You know, over time, Christianity grew to become the largest religion in the world. 2.3 billion people on the planet, the largest religion. But you might not know, in the past decades, Christianity has grown massively in the Southern Hemisphere. When you think of Christianity, you still might think primarily Northern Hemisphere and European history and North America and things like that. But Christianity has massively grown in Latin America and Asia and Africa, Southern Hemispheric. In fact, the most common demographic category of a Christian in the world, if you add up all the categories, what's the most common? Well, the most common Christian now would be a 19-year-old Brazilian woman. So think of the Christian family now and how this story speaks to the daily reality, even now in modern times, of many people. But we are the Christian family here in North America. What might it mean for us? I'm thinking about this yeast that works its way through the entire large amount of flour, and I'm thinking about how even a small amount of faith can have a major impact, can transform you. Oh, this family story is trying to remind me, I think, today that if you have even just a little bit of faith, it becomes like a yeast that can change you. I worry sometimes that we think every Christian has to have big faith. I, I worry sometimes that you think to be a real Christian, you have to claim all these massive metaphysical assertions, big faith. You have to, you have to believe fully in doctrinal notions of the Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, begotten, not made, God of God, light of light. You have to go all nice seen on the faith. All things are made through the Son of God. You have to accept these massive metaphysical assertions or you're not a real Christian. I worry that you have some huge notion of faith, that, that unless you believe all the cosmic claims of the virgin birth and resurrection and ascension and you, you take that whole big honking package of big doctrinal beliefs and unless you hold it, you're not a real Christian? Well, I want to say to you today that even if you have a little bit of faith, like a mustard seed or a little yeast, that that can begin a process that changes your life. I'm thinking of little forms of faith. I know a lot of, a lot of people that see something special in Jesus. They may not imagine that there's some big traditional or uh, um, big impressive Christian, but they can see in Jesus that there is a life of compassion and peace a life that looks like it's the full way to lead a flourishing life. They, they're magnetized to Jesus. They might not think they're very religious, but they can see some amazing things in him. That little bit of faith, well, that can begin to draw you towards the better things in life and maybe even more deeply into the faith. Christian faith can be something small and it can still be wonderful. I know there are people, I know lots of them, that don't imagine they're traditional Christians, but they want a better world, and they're interested in things about justice and serving others. And that can draw them into a life of faith. It can all start very small, like a little yeast. I think Jesus said, 
the yeast among you can become the greatest or something like that. I see little forms of faith. I see people come to church just to listen to some beautiful music, see some friends, have a cup of coffee and a good cookie. Now that doesn't seem like big, strong faith, but it's a start and it can lead to transformation. I worry that everyone thinks you have to imagine you're holding all these massive tenets of the Christian faith. You can start with just a little yeast. Maybe you imagine there's a spiritual realm. Just that alone, that, that you begin to imagine the physical realm isn't everything, that there's a spiritual realm and you want to begin to explore. Oh, that's a lot of yeast right there to begin your life of faith. I know I'm saying that you can have just a little faith and be transformed, but there always comes the authoritarian moment. It happens to me all the time. The authoritarian moment when you're talking with someone who says, well, you're not a real Christian unless. Have you had one of those moments? Or have you even felt that impulse in you yourself to define what it is to be Christian and to say someone else is not a real Christian? That authoritarian moment, it happens all the time. I was talking recently with a Jehovah's Witness, and I love all the different forms of Christianity. Jehovah's Witness is a pretty intense biblical literalism, and, and, and I may not agree with the specifics, but I love all the differences. But there came that moment when they said that if I didn't believe certain lines in the Bible, I wasn't a real Christian. Why do people, why do sometimes even myself, think that we can decide what it is to be a real Christian? What's ironic is the people that think they're the deciders, where well, there's other groups that say they're not real Christians. So who's the decider? My friend, your faith, your soul, that's between you and God. But these human institutions think they're the decider. You're the real Christian or not. Do not listen to that. The yeast among you can become the greatest. I read a New York Times article this week about a young woman in New York City, 22, and she was describing how she was not into traditional religion, didn't go to church, but she was very spiritual, but she considered the spiritual uh, you know, journey to be very private. And I get that and I think it's wonderful. As I was reading, I, I wished that she could understand the value of spiritual community, of being spiritual with others, but, but I understood what she was saying. But then she said, I am very energized to explore the concept of God, but to somehow make it different than that white patriarchal figure. And, and the word God now doesn't seem to really name the force that I feel is so essential to life. I loved that she was questioning the concept of God because I think some people think you have to have this massive defined notion of God to be a real Christian or to be of faith, but the yeast of just beginning to question God, what does that concept mean? That can start a beautiful journey of faith. I worry about what people hold on to about God. Do you know that line from Mark Twain when he said, it ain't the things people don't know that makes trouble for this world. It's the things they know that ain't so. Do you hear that? It's when you think you really do know, but it's not really true. That makes trouble. And we think we know a lot about God and some people come up with this Zeus-like notion of God, that God is sort of this white man with a beard up in the clouds and throws thunderbolts and judges, and we think we know a lot about God. But remember, God is not an object in the universe. God is infinite. God is not an object in the universe like Zeus. God is infinite. God is not a thing alongside other things that would make God finite. 
God is infinite. God is not a being. God is being itself. God does not simply exist. God is existence itself. God is infinite. Don't try to fit God into some easy conceptual category. So when that woman in New York is questioning that category, that's the yeast that creates true faith. Don't squeeze God into your own conceptual categories. Let God be God. This woman needing some starter dough, some yeast into the rest of the batch, and everything has changed. May the Spirit of God be at work in your life. Amen. Jesus mentions the three measures of a meal. When we gather for a meal, we come together to share one another's burdens, to uphold one another, to encourage one another. It is through prayer that we fulfill the elements of the measures of a meal. Let us pray together. Dear God Almighty, you are the perfecter and spreader of love. 
the one who gathers us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so whoever you are and wherever you are upon life's journey, know that God loves you. Surrender your anxious cares to God. Find your joy in serving others. Go in peace. I think it's great that we could worship together. You know, you could join our worship services live every Sunday morning on Facebook Live, YouTube, or our website, and all of that is made possible by members and friends like you. If you believe that an open-minded, loving congregation can help change the world, then consider making a donation. It will help us increase the love of God and neighbor, both in Nebraska and the world. If you would like to learn more about our church, go to firstplymouth.org. You can watch videos of the sermons, learn about our many programs and missions, then follow us to Facebook and become a friend. We now worship online at 9 a.m. and 10.30 on YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, and our website. We also add live events, so join us online. I don't know how you feel about your faith, whether you might be feeling a little lost or you're not sure at all what you believe but I hope that you can trust this story of Jesus, that even if you have a little intimation, a little sense that there is God, even the smallest notion of that, well then, you can reach out and live. Tune in again next week for another edition of Reach Out and Live.